Ever since I moved to Portugal, I've encountered places that awakened and instilled a kind of passion in me that I haven't known for years. And thus I created this video series, bestowing tribute to this geographically small, yet profoundly beautiful country. Portugal, to put it this way, might be a David in size, but it's one that certainly offers a Goliath of delights. And throughout my journey here, there are places that I keep going back to. Time and time again, I still manage to find the little pleasures, the miniature surprises. And then, there are those places that I keep meaning to go to, however elusive, however difficult to reach, however too good to be true. I persist and remain hopeful that life allows it. In this episode, I've gone to places both entirely familiar and indubitably new, encountering familiar faces, and then, as destiny calls, a quest for a new horizon. This is Jerez, or also known as the Pineda Jerez National Park. This extraordinary part of the Minho region in the north of Portugal has been on my radar for a long time, being a huge lover of nature, and it was only until recently that I was finally able to set foot and explore this masterpiece of natural landscape. In this part of Portugal, right at the border of Spain, nature reigns supreme. Lush, verdant mountains rise up around you, decked with forests and incredible viewpoints. Granite peaks punctuated with fresh-flowing waterfalls, and then rugged valleys that roll down and open wide into beautifully panoramic lakes. This is the oldest protected area in Portugal, and I can see why. It's one of the undeniably purest sights I've seen in this country. It's as if nature has woven its magic across this place, and I've been lucky enough to stay in Jerez for a week. I left the city behind and ascended to the glorious north, and from what I've learned during summertime, this place becomes an alternative summer destination for lovers of unspoiled nature retreats. We stayed by the lakeside, spending most of our time swimming in lakes, and just being surrounded by that incredible sanctuary of the evergreen. But my absolute favorite thing to do here is hiking in forests and mountain trails. Jerez is an outdoor paradise, the perfect place to take your feet everywhere. Where you can spend a whole day hiking, and plug and unwind outdoors, breathe the freshest air imaginable, drink spring water directly from fountains, place where you can discover hidden waterfalls and lagoons. And then, if your knees are up for it, climb up to viewpoints and be rewarded with stunning views. My favorite is the Miraduro de Pedra Bella, a viewpoint that truly shows you the breathtaking immensity of Jerez. During our stay here, we've also taken our feet and wheels everywhere, exploring faraway mountain villages, some of them unmoved by time. Our first stop is Villa de Jerez, this beautiful little village tucked in the river valley of Jerez, a place known for its hot springs and thermal waters. And on the other side of the valley, you'll find the sanctuary of São Bento Porta de Aberto the second largest Portuguese sanctuary next to Fatima. Here you'll find some of the most exquisite views of Jerez. When our wanderings are on Minho, we've come across a town called Povoa de Lanioso, where a castle remains standing from the Middle Ages, mounted in a huge massive. 
This castle is host to a fascinating story of a fight between the first king of Portugal, Dom Afonso Henrique, and his mother, Teresa of Leon, once the Countess of Portugal. Next on our trip is a town called Arcos de Valdevez, located west of Jerez, a town with a few classic examples of the Portuguese Baroque movement that once flourished in this northern part of the country. This town also played a pivotal part in Portuguese history, where the Battle of Valdevez took place, where the fight between Afonso I of Portugal and Alfonso VII of Leon resulted in the formation of Portugal. The deeper we mend into Minho, I realized what an outstanding region this is. That said, this is also wine country, the home to the Vinho Verde wine region. We've visited Quinta dos Abrigueiros, known as the producers of the wine Casa de Sena, and thanks to our trusted sommelier, Salvador, we were able to get private access and were welcomed by the wonderful Maria Sousa Coutinho, one of the winemakers here. This is the Casa da Senra. Casa, it means uh, home, house. Senra, it means cereals in the old Portuguese language. Wine has been produced here since the 17th century and Maria is the 11th generation that continues to live on this rooted family tradition. She explained to us that this place makes for an ideal location and climate for viticulture, given the fact that this is situated in the valley, surrounded by mountains, and therefore protecting the vineyards from the Atlantic winds. Soon she showed us the great variety of Loureiro, which originated here in the Lima Valley. Here it's Loureiro, it's bigger, the leaf it's like this, it's different, this is more typical. She also showed us Alvarinho, a grape that originated from Monsão e Melgaço and is one of the best grapes in the Vinho Verde wine region. Overall, Casa da Sena specializes in the Loureiro grape, with 90% production of its wines derived from this grape variety. Another thing I've learned here is that they make a little intervention in these lands by planting certain types of legumes to help maintain the minerality in the soil. All of these elements work together to create fresh wines with minerality and great acidity. And Casa de Senra is a wonderful example of the Lima subregion of Vinho Verde. After the escapade in Jerez and exploring the vineyards in Minha, we drove across mountain ranges to revisit another wine region that's close to my heart. Turu. There's certainly nothing like it in the world. This epitome where man and nature yield to each other, coexist in harmony, and then create something extraordinary. I set foot first in Duro a couple of years back, just before winter, and now I've revisited this place, this UNESCO World Heritage beauty, right at the height of the summer to experience this landscape from another perspective. We drove to the extremity of Trajos Monts and Alto Douro in Vila Nova de Fojcoa, close to the Spanish border where the Douro and Coa rivers meet. And this is where we saw Douro Superior at its most inexorable. The town itself, while founded in the 13th century with its Portuguese national monuments, have its deep prehistoric roots, particularly Paleolithic history, where rock carvings of the period were discovered in this region. But we didn't get a chance to see these rock art sites. These were wonderfully represented in the Coa Museum, which pays tribute to the archaeological thousand-year-old petroglyphs found here. The museum also has a restaurant where you can refresh yourself with excellent Dura wines and regional gastronomy soaking in the incredible landscape around you. Another pit stop in this Douro trip is the town of Torre de Moncorvo, a town with roots from Christian Reconquest times. There is a majestic church here, the Igreja Matriz of Troche de Moncorvo, where Mannerist architecture meets Renaissance and Manly. We stopped here briefly to admire the town, and not long after, we headed back on the road again. 
We drove south of the Duro Valley and witnessed one of the most fascinating places in this region, the historic city of Lamego. This is another city that takes a pivotal role in Portuguese history, being the location where Dom Afonso Henrique, the first king of Portugal, was crowned. But of all the city's sumptuous structures, none shines more exuberantly than Lamego's crowning glory, the Baroque Nossa Senhora dos Remedios. Perched on top of Lamego, it takes about 686 steps through the elegant staircases to reach on top of this hill, a climb that's rewarded by this stunning sanctuary, one that's designed by Nicolau Nazoni, the Italian architect famous for his buildings in Porto, including the Clerigos church and tower. And here he left his signature Baroque and Rococo architectural flair. It's a beautiful monument, one that's visited by pilgrims every year. And while you're here, admire the courtyard of the kings, built with statues high above the pillars, and in the middle, a fountain that represents the Four Seasons. This is a reminder how religion wielded power and influence over Lamego, but perhaps only second to the real power and influence over the Duro Valley, which brings us to the wines of Duro. felt like only yesterday I stepped into Duro Valley for the first time, and out of that wonderful trip with friends, I created a video that celebrated the glory of this place. I witnessed and learned what Duro has to teach me, and personally, I absorbed these philosophies deep in my gut, understanding resilience and stoicism through these landscapes. This was also where I met Sergio, our amazing tour guide in this region. Lately, I went back in the summer, a little older, hopefully a touch wiser, and greeted this guy like an old friend. And out of such generosity, Sergio has taken us around Duro once again. Along with the best company, Salvador de Sommelier, we boarded a Tesla and toured around Duro in the most sustainable way possible. This landscape felt familiar and yet outlandish at the same time. Sceneries that I've only seen in photographs unfold in real time. My eyes darting from horizon to another. Vineyards that stretch for miles, rolling in steep valleys and vertiginous mountaintops. And it was here in Casal de Loivos producers of Deologène olive oil and wines, that I was reminded of this spectacular landscape. This view was uh, listed by uh, BBC, um, I think it was 18, 19 years ago, as one of the seven uh, best views in the world. Mm -hmm. On that list you have places like, for example, the Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. or also the view over Paris from the Sacré Coeur. Summer in Duro, what a time to be here. They say in Duro, there are nine months of winter and three months of hell. Be that as it may, at least in this hell, there is wine. What matters is that I've finally experienced what it's like to be here at this time of the year. We've already known that this extreme contrast of temperatures in the valley makes for a perfect climate for winemaking, giving the wines that robust body and character. Duro is known for that, and it's still incredible to learn how much tireless effort the people whose lives are here, making the most of what Duro has to offer, and then sublimating everything, all the elements, to produce the wines and create an industry of winemaking, perhaps one of the most prestigious in the world, being the home of port wine and the table wines of the Duro demarcated region. It's widely known as the last wine region in the world where grapes are still entirely hand-picked. Before we were able to start to taste some wines, we were treated to a lovely lunch at Cantina do Vento Zero. And then afterwards, a short tour of the grounds, briefly reminding us that aside from the fact that Quinta do Vento Zero is one of the oldest and largest of the Duro estates, this place plays host to one of the most sweeping panoramas in the Duro Valley. The views here are just sensational.
after Ventuzelo, Sergio took us to our final destination in this tour, Quinta Sierra de Ordenge. This 18th century wine estate perched high on a mountaintop with exquisite views of the Douro Valley. Here they guided us through the estate's 200 years worth of history, showed us the wine cellars, and then tasted some of the excellent table wines and port wines available here. This ended our Douro trip in a truly high note. During our whole Douro adventure, we stayed in Peso de Regua, known as the Gateway to Douro, a major port wine town in this region with historical significance that goes all the way back to the first demarcation. Our stay here was capped off with an absolutely splendid dinner at a local restaurant called Atashkinia. Of all the restaurants in this town, this was my favourite. A straightforward, understated affair. It's deceptively simple furnishings hiding its true weapon. The food here is a knockout. Full of surprising creativity and flavours, made and served by gracious staff, a restaurant made even more memorable by the kindness and welcoming atmosphere of the people who work here. Just when I thought my journey ended here, not too long after this Douro trip, life has immediately thrown me back again in this part of Portugal, this time back in Invicta city, the majestic city of Porto. A couple of friends from London visited late in the summer, and suddenly I found myself back again on the one element that connects this city right up to the heart of the Douro Valley the Douro River. Suddenly, I was there on a boat, sailing in the same river, seeing Porto from another, different perspective. The same great river that served as the key artery to the flowing lifeblood of this region. The same river where Rabella boats have been transporting wine up and down the stream throughout centuries. The story of wine, one that begins from the great valleys of Douro, ends here in Porto and Villa Nova de Gaia. But the word end doesn't seem quite fitting, as from here, right at the mouth of the Douro River and the Atlantic Ocean, the history and culture of port wine begins and flows throughout the rest of the world. Sailing in this river, seeing it flow, carrying along the ripples in the water, it occurred to me how much our actions can shape the meaning and the course of our existence. What we do now can send ripples of consequence throughout an unknown future. Back then, nature presented man with an opportunity in the Douro Valley, and the people here understood what could be done to intervene and transform by virtue of this landscape into a life-giving oasis. Now, we have this whole magnificent history to appreciate. Personally speaking, my whole journey here in Portugal has presented me with an opportunity. The chance of self-improvement by speaking the language of kindness. Acts of kindness, no matter how little they are, could send ripples throughout time. The connections we make, the friendships we build, the passions we pursue, I believe are ripples of kindness to the people around us and most importantly, to ourselves. I hope this video inspires you to go out there, see with your own eyes, explore, and then be kind. One day, you'll see, as the ripples will show you, it's an oasis for the soul. <laughs>